recorded in front of a live web audience on September 26, 2012. Design Chat is brought to you by Cusp Conference, the design of everything. Go to cuspconference.com to register early and get big discounts on 2013 Cusp Conference. And by Mixel. It automatically combines your photos into fun, beautiful collages, available for free in the iOS App Store. We experienced a severe echo while recording this week that we just couldn't dodge, so apologies in advance for that annoyance, but that being said, the conversation with Koi Vin was awesome, so let's get to it. Hello and welcome to Design Chat, the best live design discussion on the internet. I'm your host, Ryan McGovern, on Twitter, I'm at Hoopajube and at Design Chat. Every once in a while, we get together with some of the coolest people from the design community. Today, we are talking to Mr. Koi Vin. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's an honor to be talking to you. So, so. The, usually the first thing we do is uh, we have we have our guests give a brief history of who you are, what you do, and why you do it for those people who may not be familiar. A brief history. I probably am best known for running the design team at NewYorkTimes.com for a little bit less than five years. I basically rebuilt that team and worked on digital products across all platforms, web, mobile, tablets, uh, Kindle, iPad, Android. And I've been blogging at subtraction.com about design and technology and culture for about uh, over 10 years now. Um, and most recently, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Mixel, which is a startup in New York. And we specialize in creativity software. And our app, Mixel for iPhone, lets you make collages with uh, Incredible ease. All you really have to do is add pictures. So that's a brief overview. Cool. Um, cool. Um, there's obviously, obviously, I mean, you put out a great deal of content, of content uh, through subtraction.com and through your speaking engagements and, and, and whatnot. So um, there, there's a lot of great stuff to sort of read up um, if you aren't familiar. Um, I want to start uh, with your even further history, having been born uh, in South Vietnam and moving to the United States when you were three years old. Is that correct? Yeah, three and a half, yeah. A long, it was a long time ago. <laughs> and, uh, and and then you, so you grew up in Maryland, and you attended uh, the Otis College of, of, of Art. Uh, or, uh, my writing is horrible. I'm so sorry. Art and Design. I Otis design. School of Art and Design uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and I grew up outside of Washington, D.C. in Maryland, and I got a great public school education. And then about the time that my parents, or that about the time that I was graduating high school, my family moved to California. So I went to art school um, at Otis, which at the time was in uh, downtown LA, uh, mm -hmm. right in the middle of gang territory. It was a pretty pretty hairy experience, but, but it was a, a great one. Lovely. Uh, so, so I, I would imagine your family experienced some some major culture shifts um, throughout yeah. each one of those moves. Um, I'm always interested, I'm always in, interested hearing in hearing about that, hearing right? Uh, it, because yeah, that's because always that's such a always heavy such a influencer of, uh, of our understanding, understanding of the world, right? and, and, yeah. and then, and then through, creative through creative professionals, professionals how then we how then we view it, we view the world, and, and, and create things for our clients and for ourselves. And for ourselves. So maybe a little bit of perspective on that from East Coast to West Coast to South Vietnam. Well, you know, we we came to the United States from Vietnam in. 1975, and um, there was definitely culture shock for me and for my family. So I, you know, most of my adolescence was kind of um, spent feeling like an outsider. Now I think all of us feel like outsiders once in a while, but um, it was really a very profound kind of sensation for me, always feeling like. Um, uh, you know, our customs and our food and just the way our family functioned was just so different from the people around us. And, and you know, for whatever reason, my family settled in a, a suburban area in Maryland where there were not a lot of Vietnamese around. So I didn't really have any other folks to bond with over that kind of uh, displacement. Um, and that's been a, I, I think that directly you know, contributed to me going into the arts. Um, basically looking for 
um, some sort of uh, sanctuary or or respite uh, in you know the visual world. When I was a kid, I just loved to draw and I loved comic books, and I just um, sort of lost myself in that world as a, a kind of escape from all of the the disconnect of, of the real world. And comic books led to understanding um, more about uh, the wider world of art, and that led to understanding more about design, and that led to to technology and, and so forth. So many designers, so many I, talk designers to I talk to um, have very specific, specific moments in their life they can life recollect. Can recollect. Um, uh, becoming aware, becoming aware that, that design is a career, career option mm -hmm. for them, that it for existed them, that at all, existed and all. that they can mm -hmm. do it. Is there a specific there a moment specific for you where that light bulb, that light turned, bulb on? turned on? <laughs> um, maybe not yet. <laughs> I don't know. I feel. I still feel like I'm winging it um, in a lot of ways. Um, mostly because, I mean, I mean that's that's kind of a glib answer, right? I understood that the design was a thing when I went to art school. I went to, to school to study um, painting, and I thought it might be a painter or an illustrator. And then halfway through, I realized there was this thing called design, and um, and that was what I was really interested in because all of my all of my work up until then had been really like design problems um, in painting form. Um, but you know. When I started to understand what design was, I started to um, to form. I mean, the ideas that I formed about how to, to create a design design career are you know, nothing like the way my career turned out. I mean, I thought I, you know, was going to be um, a, a Neville Brody type, like, like um, or that's what I aspired to. You know, to have my own international practice with these high-profile media brands, and I'd be doing this great cutting edge typography and branding and so forth. And I don't do any of that today. So um, and I don't know what I'll be doing five years from now, really. So it's very, very, um, very much a process of uh, improvisation. So um, but yeah, I did understand that there was a thing called design at one point. But you know, all my preconceptions about what it was um, have not really borne out very well. In, in 2001, 2001, you started a group, started a group uh, with some friends called Behavior. Behavior. Right. Um, and um, interesting, I think, you know, uh, even the name, even the name as, a as a sort of precursor, precursor of what was to come in, in, in interaction, interaction design. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about little that bit experience, about making that the decision to start, to start your own group with some friends, friends and the type of work you guys did. Sure. So, and I started my career in services, working at design studios. Um, in the late 90s, I went to work at a big dot-com agency that did end-to-end you know, -end web solutions for all different sorts of clients. And um, and I became a, a design director there. And then the first internet bubble started, uh, started to come apart in um, the early 2000s. And, uh, and by the fall of 2001, it became obvious um, that uh, Actually, earlier than that, um, I started to realize that my that agency that I was at was not going to stick around much longer. So, um, a few of my colleagues um, and I at that agency, we decided to um, start talk to, to to see if we could band together and form a studio and um, continue working with some of the clients that we had at that agency and that we we enjoyed working with. Um, and then, unfortunately, you know the the, um, the events of 9/11 uh, happened and really for a few months there everything shut down except for mm -hmm. very few mm -hmm. clients or very few businesses that were soldiering forth and and it, we I think had all thought okay maybe we can make the studio thing work or perhaps we can um, um, you know go out and find other jobs we'll just see which which way things go um, and after 9 11 it became obvious that we wouldn't, wouldn't be able to find jobs for um, months so um, and we did have we did have a few clients who really wanted to work with us, and so we decided to form a company and make a go of it. And that lasted for about four and a half years, or four years or so, from 2001 until the end of 2005 when I left. Um, and it was a great experience, learning how to build and run a studio, learning how to, to um, you know, to, to service a, a client roster, and um, and you know, I 
for those first four years, I was the partner who did all the administrative stuff as well as running clients and stuff. Like I, I did um, the payroll and the billing and worked with the lawyers and worked with the, um, the insurance folks and, and did all of that. And so it was, a, it was a great education. It, I find it interesting your earlier comment, comment that, that you still you feel, feel like feel you're like winging it, it. Um, yeah. after yeah. having yeah. these, yeah. you know, these types of experiences, yeah. uh, you know, running a whole running company, a company uh, and, dealing and dealing with the clients. With the clients. Um, do you feel do you that feel that's that a that sensation that, that will never dissipate? never dissipate? At least for me. I, mean, I tell this story often, like when, like, we have a daughter, uh, she's three years old now, but I remember bringing her home from the hospital when she was just a, a couple of days old. And um, I took her out, uh, we live in Brooklyn, and I took her out for a walk um, in the stroller, or I, actually maybe I, I you know, strapped her to my chest and carried her around. I remember seeing other parents in the neighborhood whose kids were maybe like a year or two years old at that time and thinking, um, wow, they really haven't figured out, they really know what they're doing. I mean, they've been at it for a year or two, they, they're, they're probably on a roll, they know how to handle these kids. And then when my, my daughter turned two, I think, I realized, wow, I'm still winging it. And I realized that the parents that I saw that I thought had, had really, you know, a lock and everything and sort, sort it out, they had no idea what they were doing either. That's one of the things that I, you know, I've come to believe as I've gotten older. It's like we're all just basically making it up as we go along. I mean, there are templates that we can follow, but for the most part, you know, just you know, put one foot in front of the other and see what happens. I, I couldn't agree more. I, couldn't agree more. You know, I, I tell I tell I, I tell a lot of people this, especially recently. Especially recently. As, as I remember coming out of college and, and looking at. You know, trying to study trying business, to study enough, business to enough to be able to navigate, navigate once I got once I got a job, job. and thinking having thinking, the impression having at the time, time that um, all of these um, large, all corporations, large corporations uh, were tightly run tightly ships, run ships. Uh, where everyone was on the everyone same was page. On the same page. Uh, it was like you know they were all well oiled well machines, oil and the longer I the large corporations are the worst. <laughs> exactly. They're the ones who, who yeah. know it's least what they're doing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's why they need to bring in consultants and service businesses to, you know, to tell them you know, how to get from you know, A to B. Many of them, not so, all of them. So, um, um, so 2006, 2006 um, talk a little bit, talk about, a little your bit about your transition to being the design director in New York Times. New York Times. Um, how did that discussion did that start? Discussion what was the relationship? relationship? Um, and, and what were your hopes right. leading into it? So, the kind of work that I specialize in at Behavior was very content heavy, um, text heavy, I should say. We worked with a lot of publications. Maybe the highest profile one was a redesign of The Onion that we did in 2005, I think, which is... Oh, cool. The Onion is a satirical newspaper, a fake newspaper, but um, you know, overhauling that site was basically like creating a news, um, a news site, uh, a real news site. Um, a mutual friend of mine and, and some folks at the Times um, told me that they were looking to hire a new design director. And, um, they, and he said, you guys should talk to Koi. And I, and I said, sure, I'd love to talk to them. And I went in for a, a discussion, thinking maybe that I could sell them on a, um, a project with my studio. Um, and, then, and then thinking perhaps that they had a, um, an opening for a design director job, not the design director job. But it quickly became apparent like they were looking to hire the, the person to head up their digital product design for the next several years. And um, it seemed like a golden opportunity. And, and the, um, the, the discussions got pretty serious pretty quickly. And before mm -hmm. um, I knew it, um, you know, I, I was um, you know, resigning my partnership at the studio at the end of 2005 and um, going to work at the New York Times in early 2006. Um, so it's hard to believe that was six years ago. Um, I'm sure I had lots of hopes and ambitions when going to the job. They seem like a distant memory now. S try to set, try to the, set, the, set the scene, set the scene a, little a little bit. 2005, 2006. 2006. Uh, uh, um, there's a lot of there's fear lot of within fear organizations, these organizations that they're, that they're, they're you know, they're, they're, they're seeing, seeing their subscriptions, their, subscriptions, their physical their subscriptions, subscriptions uh, dwindling. Uh, dwindling. Um, what, what, what was their what mindset was their at the time, time 
uh, and their mission. Their mission. Um, so well before I signed on, they had come to the realization that um, that they needed to reinvent the business as a digital business. Um, they had um, they've been running NewYorkTimes.com for ten years and, and doing so very successfully. Um, and in 2006, their goal was to, to expand that business, to, to turn their verticals like movies and travel and health into full-fledged businesses of their own. Um, at the same time, they were trying to integrate the kind of digital thinking that, that the, um, the, the quote unquote, the website part of the business brought to the table um, with um, the long legacy of, of print editorial that the, um, that the quote unquote newspaper side of the business brought to the table. So there was an integration process happening. So there were a lot of things going at once. They were, they were trying to expand, they were trying to integrate and reinvent. Um, it, was a, it was a very, um, very, very rich and rewarding time to, to experiment, to, to try new things, to learn about legacy parts of the business that, you know, by that point I, I, I committed to a career in, um, in digital design. So it was unlikely that I was ever going to get to see the inside of a, 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 um, um, a print operation the way I did at that time. And that was, that was really wonderful, really seeing how, you know, the, the front page of the New York Times is put together on a daily basis. Like that's just being able to, to sit in that room and, and see the editors put that together. That's, that's a fantastic feeling. So it was a great experience working with, with really smart people, and I learned a ton um, about every side of the business. Um, I, you know, I can't say a bad thing about it. 2006, in 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 the framework of of my life and relationships, doesn't seem like that long ago. But 2006, in the framework of digital publishing. Seems like seems decades like ago. Decades. Um, yeah, because because, because of the speed, obviously, in which everything evolves. evolves. And I think you had a really, really sort of unique really position, a unique seat, seat to be watching that watching from. That from. Yeah. Um, I'm always curious to hear about anytime I, I talk to someone uh, who's involved with a sort of journalism, a professional journalism uh, group. Uh, the, the you know the the stories about. about um, you know the the, 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 the fight the, the fight against, against uh, mass publishing. Mass everybody's a blogger. Everybody's, everybody's a journalist. But there's the but integrity, the integrity of, of professional journalism. Um, right. How much of that, how much of that um, as, as also you being also a blogger on your own and having, having doing that? Um, I just like to hear a little like bit about that conversation um, and things that you yeah. witnessed yeah. within the walls. That was um, that. That conversation was very robust at the time. Um, trying to, actually, to be fair, I think they had come to accept blogging as a component of journalism by the time I got there. Exactly how it was going to be integrated into the regular um, reporting, um, they were still working out. But there, there was not a lot of um, animosity towards blogging in general. They, they'd had that many years before, they'd already gotten past that by the time I was there. Um, but you know, on, on a case-by-case -case basis, or on, on an individual-by-individual individual basis, you would have to um, um, sort of assess each person's openness and comfort level with digital publishing um, when you worked with folks from the print side. Um, and there were a lot of folks that you, you really had to start over from scratch in terms of understanding in terms of explaining to them, getting them to understand what it means to publish digitally. I mean, there were a lot of editors who tried to, you know, do things on the web. In they were doing things on the web for the first time, 2006, 2007, even 2008. You know, the first sort of naive presumptions of the way digital media should work. Um, that for a lot of us had shaken out in the early 90s, um, making, making the kinds of, you know, quote, unquote, rookie mistakes that, that people do when they first come online. That was still somewhat present 
at the times um, with certain individuals. So you really had to, we really had to sort of like, sort of evangelize these principles of digital publishing and work with mm -hmm. them to, work with the editors to, to, um, to help them come to, to an understanding of those principles um, in a way that made sense for their worldview, for their, for their subject matter expertise. Um, um, I just kind of feel, like feel like, like it's, it's fun to fun project to back at that time and, and hearing those conversations. Um, so, so moving, moving forward, forward, you you, um, um, you wrote a book, wrote a book um, about uh, the same time that you left, I believe, uh, Ordering uh, Disorder, Disorder, Ordering Disorder, Disorder, Disorder uh, Great Principles for web design, web design um, and, and one can infer one can that infer you know these uh, these had a number of lessons, number of lessons um, and a number of those best, best practices, practices that, that you you had been living uh, you know at a very high level very higher, than, higher most. than most um, uh, talk a little bit about the process of writing the book um, and, and then the reactions that you got after it, it uh, was released so I've been writing about using the typographic grid you know the, these design principles from the world of print um, in the context of publishing for the web and designing for the web for a number of years, um, you know, starting even before the time I got to the New York Times. Um, and um, a very, very, you know, a great editor, a really nice guy um, at Peach Pit had been after me to, to write a book about it for a while. Um, and I'd been putting it off. And it, when I finally decided to leave the uh, the time I said I said okay this is the opportunity for me to take a, a couple months out and, and, and write a book um, and that was a really hard process writing a book is not easy and for me anyway it was not particularly fun I I didn't expect <laughs> it to be that way because um, up until then I've been blogging sort of um, you know at a very kind of profuse rate um, on my uh, over at subtraction.com it's very easy for me to turn out um, uh, content, but um, you know, by the time uh, when it came time to sit down and actually write a book, I, I just found the whole seriousness of it to be very intimidating, and it just made every single you know sentence and paragraph and chapter really, really difficult to do. And um, and by the time I finished that book, it, to me, it was sort of like the last thing I ever wanted to say on that subject, and, and I just wanted to try and move on from that. And, you know, I've, I've really tried not to, to wade back into the pool in terms of talking about grids and design, web design, quote unquote web design, so forth um, since then. Uh, you know, there's been all kinds of you know, um, advents in terms of you know, innovations in that area, um, you know, um, frameworks and tools and you know, advancements in CSS and um, responsive design and stuff like that and that's a lot of stuff is great and I have no no qualms with it but I just I'm not interested in that stuff anymore I, I kind of had to, said what I've had, had to say about it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to remind the audience I see we've got a number of viewers here that's great uh, a couple text questions popping up um, um, you can't ask you questions. Can't ask this questions. is an interactive experience, guys. This isn't like going to, you know, watching something on TV. This is, you know, you can be part of this conversation, part of the dialogue. So I encourage you to do that. Ask questions. If you've got a webcam, you can come on camera and, you know, just chat us up. Just say hi. Even if you don't have a question, we'd like to see your face. Um, so ask those questions. We'll be starting to take those in a few minutes. It's 8.30. Uh, we're going to be chatting for another half hour or so. Again, we're talking to Mr. Coy Vin. Uh, former design director of NewYorkTimes.com, but he has done many other things since that. Uh, one of which I'm very excited to talk about. <coughs> excuse me, is your experience creating iOS apps and apps in general? I think Mixel now is both is cross-platform. Is that correct? We're iPhone only right now. Um, we started out in um, November of last year. We launched an iPad app. And um, in August of this year, we launched an iPhone app and they decided to shut down our iPad app. Both of them are called Mixel, but the second app, the iPhone app, is, is uh, very different, sort of based on the learnings of, of the first app. Um, uh, but of course, you know, an iPhone app will run on your iPad. But it, it won't run on Android, sadly. A big challenge a big that challenge many people that many who have uh, uh, endeavored uh, into endeavored creating uh, mobile apps mobile uh, have discovered, have discovered. Um, you know, make it, making everything make work everything the same on all devices. On all devices. 
I'm sure is a daunting sure task to begin with, to begin with especially, uh, especially for such a uh, visual-based app. So uh, describe a little bit about, little bit about what the app, its current state, current does. State does. Um, Mixel is a bit like a photo sharing app, like, um, like an Instagram and so forth. It's a social network. You, you log in. Um, you follow people. People follow you. Um, but what we're trying to do is get people to take the photos that they're, they're capturing every day in their everyday lives. Um, and people are only taking more and more photos each day, shooting more and more photos. Um, and sort of combine them together into these little narratives in the form of collages. And um, the great thing about the app is it makes it exceedingly easy to create something that looks great. All you have to do is just choose the photos that you want to go into the collage. The app will pull them in, whether it's from your phone, it's from Facebook, it's from Instagram, um, and will lay them out for you um, in an automated fashion. And you can tweak the layout, you can sort of resize things and center things within um, the, the, the crops that, that the app gives you by default. But if you don't like the layout, you just tap the shuffle button and it'll give you a new layout. And if you don't like that one, you can just keep tapping shuffle over and over and over again. Um, we also have different uh, look and feels um, or, or style. So, you, so there's one that looks like a um, like an antique photo, and another one that looks like a like a very um, very regular grid, another one that looks uh, like a silver tone print, and so forth. Um, it's really really fun to um, to sort of t take all these images that you're you're generating and collecting, and sort of tell them uh, in these very succinct stories that that um, do uh, say much more than a single photograph can say. When, when when Mixel, when Mixel was, was an inkling, an inkling. When, Mix, when, when Mixel was, Mixel was the, the first seed, first of, a seed thought, of a thought, I, I'm sure I'm at the sure time you were thinking to yourself, I want to make an app, I, I, I want to participate in, in the mobile interactivity. What were some of the other ideas that maybe didn't get fleshed out, you know, things you know, that got crumpled up and tossed in the garbage can? Well, actually, the original inkling was not necessarily to make Mixel. It was to, to build a company. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I came from the services business, working for clients. When I went to the Times, for the first time in my career, I was on the, the quote-unquote client side or, or working on products uh, full-time mm -hmm. and nurturing products through several iterations. And I just found that to be enormously satisfying, much more satisfying than working with clients. Um, but eventually, I started to feel that I need to be much closer to the, the products that I worked on in terms of really owning all of the final user experience design and, and product design um, decisions. And I realized that in order to do that, I would, um, I would probably need to, to start a company and, and invent a product and bring it to market and learn how to do all of that stuff. So that was the initial, that was the initial impulse. It wasn't to say I want to build an app, and to say I want to build a, a company. Um, you know, we we started out very interested in this idea of of imagery, but specifically on tablets, specifically on the iPad, um, getting people to to draw. Um, in um, we had early prototypes that were somewhat like uh, draw something, the game, um, but um, not quite not quite games, more like um, more like uh, creative environments, um, mm -hmm. um, and um, and the iPad app was still a collage app, but it was it was very different in terms of being much more geared towards creating quote unquote art um, than than uh, geared towards sharing your photos. So we've been through a, a number of ideas, but yeah, the motivation in the beginning was really to to build a company and to, to own a product and, and to nurture it and to to, to really you know um, put my best foot forward into the marketplace. Um, I want to uh, remind the audience, actually, I forgot to mention it earlier. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, if you uh, want if to, you want to uh, sign, uh, sign in and participate, the way to do that is type something in the chat room and you'll be prompted uh, to sign in with Facebook or Twitter. Um, and then you can participate. Um, so you recently relaunched that Mixel app uh, a couple a couple months ago. Um, what have your reactions been to the new version, and, and, and what's what's the next step? Is there another iteration? Uh, do, is it is it? Are you happy with its current state? Well, the thing about being on the product side and owning the product and, and being the co-founder and, and head of a 
company is you know that nothing is ever really finished. You always have more to do, more that you want to do, and more that you're going to learn from from your customers, from the market. Um, so that's the way we look at it. There's always more to do. We, we actually have a new version launching this evening that um, right. that right. lets you um, uh, send postcards right from within the app. So if you make something in Mixel, you can actually address a postcard, write a quick message, and even effectively stamp it and send it out, and it'll arrive at somebody's post um, mailbox um, a few days later. So that's that's a new feature we're rolling out um, Neat. tonight. It's also Neat. this new version's iPhone 5 optimized as well. Um, and um, and we, we also have built in a tagging system, a lot like Facebook tags. We actually support Facebook tags in the new version. So we're going to be you know, continuing to, to roll out new features and enhancements um, like that it, it, with, with the, the, the idea of continuing to grow the audience for Mixel and, um, and to make the app ever more you know, viral and, um, and um, you know, reach as many people as it possibly can. Um, but you know the, the the overall journey is you know, learning what we've done in the past, learning what we did in the iPad app, learning fr from those mistakes that we made, from the things that we did right, and <coughs> and fine tuning this product so that we get a better um, quote unquote product market fit um, for what we're doing. We're going to take our first take question from the audience tonight from Mr. Gary Holmes. Gary Holmes. Who wants to know, do you plan on creating other apps? Also, what's the fascination with Batman? Um, I, don't, I don't really have um, a fascination with Batman. It's just sort of something you that... You put the mask on, mask on? Yeah. <laughs> while you answer the question, you're going to come out. I can't even remember where this app, this mask came from. I think it just... I, I, um, my, um, my girlfriend brought it home a few days ago. Um, but um, I don't know. Batman's just a cool guy, I guess. Um, other apps, um, you know, the company is Mixel. So you know, we one of the things I've learned is to build um, a social network product like Mixel. It's very hard to um, to split your attention. So we um, we don't have the bandwidth right now. We're a very small company. We don't, we don't have the bandwidth to run more than one one product or one app, and, uh, and we really we really like where Mixel is going. So you know we're focused on enhancing that and um, and uh, and pushing that forward. Um, a follow up to that: How big is we? Have the group creating the app? You partners? Um, who define we? Sure. So there's five of us. Um, I'm the CEO, so I do um, most of all the business stuff, raising money, working with investors, doing press partnerships, just um, you know, making sure you know there's money in the bank and, and, and people show up at work. My co-founder Scott is a CTO. Um, he work, He's an iOS developer and a server side developer. Really, really terrific, incredibly versatile guy. Um, we have um, Akiva, who is um, mostly an iOS developer, though he does some server-side work too. And he's he's responsible for um, for a lot of the bells and whistles in um, the iPhone app. Um, a lot of the, the, co the cooler things that the app does. Um, it's the result of his creativity. Um, we have Roy, who's um, just a fantastic um, visual designer and client-side coder, and you know, a great UX person. And we have Melissa, who um, is a, like a, a full-time um, intern who does a lot of UX stuff, but also just does, just covers a whole range of, of different activities um, from you know, marketing to, to press to you know, event planning to all, all, all different kinds of stuff. So, so there's five of us. It's a, it's a very tight knit group, and, and the best thing about it is it's a really great group of people. You know, it's it's fun to show up at work in the morning, and and the product that we, that we've shipped is really a direct result of all five of us. It's, it would be very different if there were, you know, there was any change in that personnel because um, everybody's ideas are you know, fully embedded into into Mixel. Having had the, the experience of uh, building a company, and building a team, and putting people in place that you thought were uh, um, complement each other. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. Talk a little bit about the experience of, of creating this team that you knew was being built for a very specific purpose. 
Well, recruiting is one of the hardest things um, that you can do building a company. You really have to look far and wide, especially in this market, to attract really good talent, um, especially when you're trying to build iOS apps, because there's so much demand for the people who, who, um, who make those kinds of, um, uh, who, who can make the, who, who can build and launch and, and support and iterate on a professional grade iOS application. It's just, the, the competition is so great. So, you know, we've just been lucky that we found a few great people like, um, you know, Akiva came to us from Apple. Um, that's a huge win for us. Um, Roy came to us from Hashable and he's, he's an incredibly talented person. Um, mostly though, it's, it's not that I'm looking for somebody who, who can build like a great collage app. I mean, that's, that's part of my thinking when I'm looking for these people. Um, but the most important thing is, you know, finding good people, people that you like, people that you're going to enjoy working with side by side, that you're going to have a, a healthy free exchange of ideas with and be able to, to argue with passionately without losing your head and without you know, losing um, you know, respect for one another. So that's, that's the hardest part is, is trying to find those kind of people and put together a team like that. I like that I you like brought, that up, you brought up, up the fact that, fact that <laughs> it's okay to argue, it's okay to argue. that it's, uh, uh, that it can be in can fact, be a healthy thing. thing. How, how do you how sort do of you approach sort that of topic, topic or deal with it as it happens? As it happens? Um, you know, I think in a bigger company you would build protocols or um, methodologies for surfacing arguments and and interrogating them in a constructive way and capturing the feedback and stuff like that. But at a small company, you know, you just have them. You just you just get it out there and you you know you say what's on your mind. And if you disagree, um, somebody disagrees with you, you expect them to to say, no, that's not the way I think it should go. And then you just remember like you're like, it's not possible. During the, the whole process of building this iPhone app, I always kept in mind that it's not going to be possible to launch the app without, if I lost any one of those people. Um, so you keep that in mind when you're having debates. You don't want, you don't, you don't want to, it's certainly not to the point of, of um, being held hostage by, you know, other people showing up at work, um, but you know you you want to have your disagreements and your discussions and your debates um, um, respectfully and um, and um, in real time, not bottling things up, not not waiting for the next day, not not you know pouring your thoughts into into a a lengthily worded email or something like that. Just sort of you know bringing them up when they come up. That's I think the most important thing. <laughs> I can imagine you're facing a number of challenges right now, but as um, a, a small uh, sort of newer group, what is the largest challenge that you guys face collectively? For the company? Yeah. Yeah. Just growing the network. You know, you, in order to succeed at the game that we're playing, you just have to keep on growing the network. Um, getting people to download that app and try it, and then, um, and then coming back, you know, day after day, week after week. That's that's what all of our effort is is geared towards right now. It's like trying to, to make the app more viral, uh, more addictive, um, so that people, you know, just can't put it down and can't stop telling their friends about it. And it's really, really difficult to do that. It's, um, you know, there's there are a million things you can do. There are a million things that you that that are that you can legitimately argue are contributing factors to that, but you only have X number of hours in a day, so you have to really pick and choose the ones that would really matter. What would you describe? What, would you describe, like, like, what, are, the what are the steps in, in deciding, deciding that, um, that um, a design change is going to happen with the, happen the user experience? experience. Um, is it group is review? Group review? Is there a hierarchy? A hierarchy? Uh, what, what are the ways what, what that you guys go about, you know, changing those changing interactions? interactions. Um, a lot of it is based on user feedback, what we see um, 
you know, people email and tweet and, and post on our uh, support boards. Um, a lot of it is based on our own usage of the app over time, um, continuing to, um, to look and relook at fe different features and see how they're, they're scaling along with the audience. Um, and then we have a discussion about what we think is working, not working. We try and capture those things um, as issues um, in an issue tracker. And, um, and um, you know, we'll follow through until those issues are closed or move them on to a, a new project and so forth. Uh, so the ideas can come from anywhere. They can come from people. They can come from the engineering side. They can come from the design side. They can come from an investor and so forth. And, um, the actual, you know, implementation process is um, the idea will come in. Um, Roy or Melissa or myself will sketch out the user interface changes that would be necessary to make it happen, and we discuss it with um, Scott and Akiva, and they say they like it or they don't like it, and they, or they'll you know, push for a different approach, and then uh, we keep iterating, and then they'll build and iterate, and then we'll get out there and test it. It's, it's very ad hoc. It's not really a, a, a discreetly defined process. It's just sort of, you know, as things come in, we try to prioritize them and then act on them. <coughs> We've got another We've question got another from the audience here from Jesse, Jesse Adrian Gola, who asks, are you building, building a company to sell or keep? Which I think brings up, you know, that entrepreneurial issue about, you know, <coughs> you know, you know, Let's project Let's five, project years, five in years. Mitchell yeah. takes Mitchell off like takes Instagram off. did. Uh, everyone on an iOS device uses it and interacts and with it, and it's got and that, and it's got that got stickiness. stickiness. And Apple comes and along Apple and says, along hey, we want to buy you guys because we think that should be part of the, that, the next iOS. Do you sell? You're one of the things I've learned as an entrepreneur is you don't take any options off the table. Um, because when you take options off the table, um, you have. Um, you, you limit your worldview and you limit your ability to to execute. So you know we set out to build um, something that will last, and and that's what we want to do. That's what we're we're trying to do. Um, at the same time, we have investors, investors who have been very supportive, and part of you know our responsibility, my as as CEO, my fiduciary responsibility is to maximize you know, their investment. So it just all depends on the circumstances. If, if circumstances suggest that um, we should sell, then um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna reject that um, that option out of hand. You know, at this moment, it's it's you know gonna be something that I'm gonna you know, consider at, um, um, at at every opportunity. Um, and if it makes sense, then we'll do it. If it doesn't make sense, then we won't do it. So it's it's I think very hard to um, to um, to pre prejudge or predetermine that, that kind of uh, outcome. <coughs> Great question, Great Jesse. Question, Thank you Jesse for asking, asking that. that. Um, uh, I appreciate it. Appreciate um, sorry about all the coughing, guys. I think I'm coming down with something. But um, um, well, great. Well, uh, uh, Subtraction.com. Subtraction First, First, First of all, awesome URL. URL. How, long How long have you had that? Have you had that? I think I registered that in um, 1997. A long time, and even then, I was surprised that it was available. Even then, um, it, by all rights, that should have been um, gone by 1997. So. <laughs> and the motivation. Oh, motivation. Uh, it's just it adheres to my design philosophy, my, my minimalist design philosophy, where um, you know, there's that old ad adage from um, Alexandra. Um, uh, Oh my God! I can't. It's got a French name. He wrote the little little print. Um, anyway, he said, um, you know, um, something to the effect of um, um, design is not done when it's not completed when you're done adding things. So it's done when um, you're done um, taking things away from it. So this process of subtraction of taking things away from the design, I think, is is a really powerful one, and, and what I've always tried to do in, in any design solution that I've worked on is to look at uh, what the what's the bare minimum that we can do to, to get the maximum effect. Interesting, and and 
I read that at some point you made the transition from it was hosting uh, your personal work and design work to I'm, go I'm no, going to you know, uh, collect my thoughts and publish them. Um, what was the impetus for that? So when I first when I first registered it, I didn't really know what to do with it. I was really treating it as a um, uh, just an online outlet for my portfolio. Um, and I was really thinking of it in the way that a print designer, and I was a print designer at the time, really thinking of it as, uh, as the way a print designer would think of, of, um, of publishing something on the internet, meaning it was just a digital version of something that I would have, um, in another time, paid a couple thousand dollars to do a short run of at a printer. Um, and, um, and so I had a lot of fun putting my portfolio online and figuring out um, uh, you know the the rudiments of HTML um, back then, um, but I kind of lost some steam and wasn't really able to keep publishing to the site, and I just sort of um, just sort of tinkered it with it here and there. And then blogging software came along, and that really instantly just I just recognized that really makes a lot of sense. It's it's very simple software that lets you update a site regularly, which is what I want to do. Um, and I initially just started posting links and. Um, and I thought I was going to start posting more work, like from my sketchbooks and, and so forth. But I ended up just writing a lot and sort of using it as an outlet to um, air my thoughts and, and work out my thoughts on different subjects, um, design and technology and culture. And, uh, and I just really enjoyed it, really enjoyed the forum, and just um, just uh, kept doing it for um, for a long, long time, and I've gotten so much, so much in return from doing it too. It's been been a great experience. So, so, so you you mentioned, you mentioned that, you mentioned it's, that it's, it's a place that helps you work out your work thoughts, out your <laughs> but has it but been has or it is it or currently uh, a uh, forum for forum discussion? For discussion? Are there a lot of comments? Did you ever have comments have enabled? <clears throat> is that something is that, that you're looking for? Or, or, well, or just, I've, I've uh, almost just always had. I've almost always had comments enabled, and um, and I'm very frequently, you know, um, rewarded by the comments. So I, I get great discussion there, and and um, on the whole, the commenters are very civil and very intelligent. Um, um, at the same time, you know, it's you know, running a company and trying to run a blog at the same time are really really difficult, and I, I haven't been able to keep up with it as much as I would like. Um, and mm -hmm. comments are. Expensive um, in terms of effort, in terms of um, what it takes to maintain them, and, and what it takes to to root out the spam. And uh, you know, I've, I've considered going the route of, um, of more more modern or, or more tumble blog like like um, uh, sites and, and removing the comments. Um, and then um, I think there's a certain attraction to that because then it's more like um, just what I'm thinking, just thrown out there. And if people want to respond to me in their own blog, that's great. And, and they can link back to me and so forth. But um, um, when you have comments, you are very much hosting a conversation, and um, and sometimes that's that is um, a lot to bear. <clears throat> so, so aside from the blog, the, blog, the app, the app uh, uh, a growing the family, family, I'm sure you have tons, tons of time to experience, time to experience uh, other, parts other parts of the web and, and web interaction. And interaction. Um, what are what are other what things are that are catching your eye right now? What, what are other whether they're mobile or, or web, just web based? Um, um, you know, what are what are some properties maybe that um, that are intriguing you and, and making you come back? This is the this is the toughest question. I never have an answer for this question, even though I should. I mean, there's always something that I find interesting. Um, but um, I mean, I'm I'm very fascinated by iOS, um, both on tablet and on, on on phone, um, and that's what I'm mostly interested in, in at the moment. Um, um, oh, I, I actually have a good answer now. Um, I think there's really been a very interesting um, effect of iOS style design and user experience um, uh, creeping back onto the web. Um, there's a, mm -hmm. a, a new site that launched this week um, that I'm friendly with the editor. Um, it's called Quartz, so it's qz.com. And um, you open it up in a web browser, and it looks like a t um, like a um, an iPad app, um, a very very good iPad app, um, and um, 
this is a brand new news site and brand new news organization. And I really think, um, I'm not sure they've got it exactly right, but I really do think they, they are onto something in terms of recognizing that the, the quote unquote old style of, of news des design or, or of news sites, um, like you know, what I did at NewYorkTimes.com, that, that is not necessarily gonna survive going forward. It's really, um, it's really a mobile world now. And I think, I think we may look back um, at the kind of design um, that was done on the web um, in the, um, the first decade of the 21st century as um, sort of very, very immature. And, um, um, and we're, we may look back at, um, at the introduction of iOS and that style of interaction design, user experience design being very, very, very purpose-built, very focused on simple interactions um, and um, stripping away the dozens of links that most most news sites have. Um, that may turn out to be what digital design really looks like. And it, it, um, it um, I think, may influence basically all kinds of um, interaction design. And we won't see the kind of, of pages that I used to design at New York Times anymore um, in five or 10 years. <laughs> it's an interesting it's an subject, interesting subject. <clears throat> excuse me, especially in the context of uh, Android, Android versus iOS, right? right. Um, and I think um, that's reflected that's in, in the sort of, sort of um, uh, development, development philosophies of, of both, uh, the one mm -hmm. being very closed, closed and there's a yeah. set of there's rules and you can play within a sandbox, within a sandbox. and the other having the yeah, philosophy having of the philosophy it's open, anybody, anybody can do anything, anything. Wild, wild Wild West. <coughs> Frame that sort of discussion uh, of design, mobile design philosophies in that context. So your question is, I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm sorry. <coughs> Pardon me, sorry. Um, um, it, the question really is in, really is in um, and you started to really started answer it in, in, in that you see where it's going in the future, and the, 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 the more interactions are going to be centered around these iPad-like interfaces. Um, but I think it's interesting to note that the, the two platforms are creating and breeding different types of design. Um, yeah, I think so. I think an Android design is still reasonably similar enough to iOS design to lump them, to group them comfortably together and say that these things are very different from the kinds of design that we saw in web browsers um, before 2007 when the iPhone debuted. Um, I think they're different, but I think they're of the same flavor. You know, you can argue about the quality of them, but you know, you open up a, a music player or you know, um, a note app on Android. It might have, they might make some different aesthetic choices, but they're they're not going to have, you know, a right rail full of uh, banner ads and uh, text ads and links to other parts of the app and so forth. It's it's still basically software design and not page design. Um, for what it's mm -hmm. worth. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we're, we're nearing on the 9 o'clock hour uh, in Chicago. It's, it's already flown by, a quick hour. Um, I want to thank everybody who um, participated in the chat and, and came and watched. Uh, we're going to start wrapping up now. Uh, everybody follow Koi on Twitter, at Koi, K-H-O-I. He's got his, his blog, it's attraction.com. Um, and update your Mixel apps tonight. There's a new release, I think. Right. Actually, it was so Actually, funny, about five, five minutes after you mentioned it, I got a little notification saying, hey, I've got a, 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 new, a new version. So that was really cool. Awesome. Um, uh, just want to say thank you, Corey, for uh, spending, spending the time with us. Thanks so much for having me. It was really fun. No doubt. Um, and next week, we're going to be talking to Rob Lukatka. Uh, on Twitter, he's at French Focus. You might know him that way. He's a very cool designer from Chicago, so please join us for that. Awesome. Um, Thanks again to Koi, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks a lot.